demonstrating Mescaline's impact on Aldous Huxley's interpretations of romantic poetry. Huxley published the results of his self-experiments with the psychoactive chemical mescaline in The Doors of Perception, which drew its title from William Blake's The Marriage of Heaven and Hell and contributed to Blake's popularization in the 20th century. Despite Huxley's acknowledged impact on the popular reception of romanticism, hardly any scholarship has investigated Huxley's views on romantic poetry over time. Rather than associating mescaline with a pre-existing interest in romanticism, I present evidence that Huxley's mescaline experiences directly resulted in his subsequent appreciation for the poetry of Blake and William Wordsworth. Mescaline provided Huxley with a vision of nature and humankind as inherently interlinked, which supplanted his prior views of nature as fundamentally alien. This transformed view of nature led Huxley to reverse decades of outspoken hostility towards romantic poetry. As I will show here, his characterizations of Blake and Wordsworth shifted from accusations of naive escapism to effusive praise for their ecological visions for the potentials of human culture. In demonstrating the potential for psychedelic chemicals to transform readings of canonical romantic poetry, this presentation argues for the importance of continuing scholarship on the relationships between poetry and altered states of consciousness within the frameworks of narrative medicine and cognitive literary studies. Although recent Huxley scholarship focuses primarily on Brave New World, his dystopian novel from 1932, Huxley was one of the most prolific writers in the English language and one of the most impactful public intellectuals of the 20th century. He earned a reputation as the foremost satirist of his age after the widely acclaimed publications of Chrome Yellow in 1921 and Antic Hay in 1923. As an indication of Huxley's cultural significance, Philip Goldberg notes that his death interrupted news reports on the day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Departing from his early satire, I became interested in Huxley as the author of The Doors of Perception, which he published as his 40th, so 4-0, book in 1953. Doors would go on to become a bible of the 1960s counterculture and established an enduring vocabulary that would influence how subsequent authors and scientists characterized psychedelic experiences in the 20th century. When I began this research, I expected to find scholarship attesting to Huxley's longtime interest in romantic poetry, since I assumed that Huxley chose his title based on masculine synergy with his pre-existing interest. But I quickly discovered that Huxley's relationship to romanticism was not so simple. As Nicholas Williams observed in, in a 2009 article from the journal Romanticism, the precise nature of the relation between Blake and Huxley has for the most part been ignored or, when considered, largely trivialized. As a case in point, William cites Dent, Dent Shirley and Jason Whitaker's book, Radical Blake, where Huxley is described as adopting a particular brand of Blakean mysticism that celebrates the individual's free will to create a universe in his or her own image. William skeptically reads this claim as a fetishization of the solipsistic imagination, a whimsical curiosity that emphasizes the proliferation of make-believe worlds at the expense of social significance or political engagement. Shirley and Whitaker identify Huxley as exemplary of a sustained trend, wherein later users of Blakeian imagery and language repeatedly suppress or avoid the inherently social and political force of his work. I discovered the source of confusion between these authors um, in the conflicting portrayals in Huxley's uh, text and pretext from 1932, which seems to support the authors of Radical Blake. Huxley criticizes Blake here, writing that, quote, the implication here is that our imaginations can create the world in their own image, but experience shows that the processes of cleansing and improvement cannot last for more than a very short time. We are not free to create imaginatively a world other than that in which we find ourselves. That world is given. Blake wants the world to be different from what it is and asserts that, by some miracle, it will become different. And in the first moment of reading, we generally believe him because he is a great and most persuasive artist and because, because what he says is always partly true and wholly desirable. No philosopher is quite so exciting as Blake, for none has the art of mingling such profound and important truths with such beautiful, wish-fulfilling errors. In this passage, Huxley is commenting on the same section from Blake's Marriage of Heaven and Hell that he would later make famous with his 1954 publication of Doors of Perception. Quote, 
If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. Based on this passage, it is unsurprising that Shirley and Whitaker would accuse Huxley of falling prey to the idea of a Blakean mysticism that is based on an impossible desire to be rid of the world. The problem then is not that Shirley and Whitaker misread Huxley, as Williams implies, but rather that they had only read some of him. As I will demonstrate here, Huxley's assessment of Blake in text and pretext is representative of his skeptical views on romantic transcendence prior to his engagement with Masculine. For decades, Huxley was outspoken about his disgust with William Wordsworth in particular. In The Burning Wheel, a 1916 collection of Huxley's poetry, he included extended parodies of romantic lyric poetry. Huxley's poem, The Walk, is a direct and explicit affront to Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey. Although Huxley adopts Wordsworth's poetic diction, meter, and rhyme schemes, the poems have more overall differences than similarities. Where Wordsworth's poetic rapture provides a grand synthesis of contraries, merging self, other, and landscape with past, present, and future times, Huxley's poem, by contrast, represents the cold brutality of irreconcilable differences. During an excursion through the countryside, Huxley's male and female protagonists become increasingly alienated from the environment and from each other. As they gradually come to see their positions as radically incompatible, their philosophical discussion degenerates into the silence of stalemate. The poem's conclusion represents neither comfort nor epiphany, with the male protagonist critiquing Wordsworth's search for ecstatic transcendence. Quote, but poor old infinite's dead, long live his heir, lord here and now, for all the rest is windy nothingness, or at the best homemade chimera, bodied with despair, headed with formless, foolish hope. In a 2011 book, Jerome Mechier describes the walk as an attempt to vanquish the harmful illusions promoted by Wordsworth's dangerous worldview. To Huxley, Wordsworth was a falsifier whose rosy whitewashing of the human condition directly promoted the cultural degradation apparent to Huxley in his day. This disgust is still apparent nine years later with a 1925 publication of Those Barren Leaves. Written at the height of Huxley's penchant for scathing satire, this novel follows a group of cultural elites and intellectuals, revealing them as lonely, superficial individuals despite their pretensions to sophistication. Within the story, the poet Francis Shelifer derides the self-deception promoted by, quote, meaningless Wordsworthian formulas after he fails to duplicate Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey or the Prelude, unable to find in nature any spark of meaningful vitality running through creation. The commonality between these two references is Huxley's belief in a fundamental irreconcilability between nature and humankind. By this account, any attempt to merge individual consciousness with the natural world is merely the result of self-deception. Huxley systematizes this previously implicit motivation in his essay, Wordsworth in the Tropics, which he published in the 1929 collection, Do What You Will. In this essay, Huxley writes that, quote, the Wordsworthian adoration of nature has two principal defects. The first is that it is only possible where nature has been nearly or quite enslaved by man. The second is that it is only possible for those who are prepared to falsify their immediate intuitions of nature. Our direct intuitions of nature tell us that the world is bottomlessly strange, evil even when it is kind and beautiful, sometimes even unimaginatively, unimaginably because inhum inhumanly evil. A voyage through the tropics would have cured Wordsworth of his too easy and comfortable pantheism. Huxley argued that Wordsworth's pleasant memories of transcendent vision depended on the heavily curated natural world of the English countryside. His final line here is biting, as if to say, let's throw Wordsworth into a tropical jungle and see how much he likes nature after all. Two years later, Huxley continues his attack on Wordsworth's perceived complacency in the New Romanticism, an essay published in Music at Night. The title refers to Huxley's ironic characterization of contemporary modernist literature as the New Romanticism. For Huxley, uh, modernism represented a perverse inversion of traditional romantic literature, or quote, the old romanticism turned inside out, 
While Huxley viewed traditional romanticism as obsessed with personal liberties and individual transcendence at the expense of, social, of societal realities, the new trend merely subsumed individuality within a monotonous hive-like collectivity of abstract form. For Huxley, both versions of romanticism represented one-sided excess, childish fixations with imaginary abstractions. Just as, the, as art depended on a mix of novelty and tradition, he believed that the naive goals of pure individualism or pure collectivism were equally impossible to achieve. After this, Huxley seals his distaste for Wordsworth in a 1932 letter to Edward Sackville West, where he describes the search for quality writing within Wordsworth's body of work as being like extracting radium from pitch blend one gram in 200 tons, or essentially looking for a needle in a haystack. Thus far, Huxley has demonstrated remarkable consistency over three decades in his views on romantic poetry and on Wordsworth in particular, which is why I became so perplexed by Huxley's 1959 lecture series at UC Santa Barbara. Huxley was invited by the English department to be the university's very first visiting professor. An edited version of his talks was published posthumously in 1977 as The Human Situation. Huxley introduced his lecture series as an attempt to grapple with the fundamental problems of his time, ranging from the brutality of war to environmental destruction. Each lecture advocated for changes in the individual's relationship to society and to nature as necessary steps in remedying these problems. Huxley asked, quote, who are we? How should we, how should we be related to the planet on which we live? How are we to develop our individual potentialities? If we start with these problems and make them central, we can obviously bring together information from a great number of at present completely isolated disciplines. I think it is probably only in this way that we can create a thoroughly integrated form of education. Huxley would be pleased to hear that four decades later, beginning in the 1990s, the English department would begin to create the very interdisciplinary research centers that he envisioned in his inaugural lecture. And it's worth noting that last year I was interviewed for a position, a cognitive literary studies tenure track position there. And although the search committee said that I was their first choice, the larger department said that my work was too controversial. Too controversial. So even though I had come far, it still is an indication of how far our field still has to go to gain um, currency and recognition. In Huxley's third lecture titled More Nature and Art, Huxley characterizes Wordsworth in a manner that is indistinguishable from his previous views. He states that, quote, I am an unregenerate Wordsworthian. I regard Wordsworth as among the four or five greatest English poets and a man who contributed insights of enormous importance in regard to what our relationship towards the world should be. Wordsworth's whole idea was that man and nature are closely interlinked, that morality goes right back into our relations with the world, and that our sense of the divine can be most powerfully mediated through our relations with the world of nature. Pretty different from what we were hearing before. Huxley's Santa Barbara lectures became the smoking gun in my research for this chapter. How did Huxley manage to reverse decades of suspicion about romantic claims to transcendence? What sparked such a dramatic shift? I argue that Huxley's perception of romanticism was in fact transformed by masculine which he experienced for the first time in 1953 under the supervision of Humphrey Osmond. Osmond had been testing the potential for masculine and LSD to treat alcoholism and various mental health disorders at the University of Saskatchewan in Canada. Immediately afterward, Huxley wrote a letter to, the, to his editor describing the experience, writing, quote, no unpleasant physical results, no lowering of intellectual capacity, just transformation of consciousness so that one knows exactly what Blake meant when he said, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear as it is, infinite and holy. Huxley ingested 400 milligrams of mescaline on May 3rd, 1953, at 11 o'clock in the morning. He begins his account by meditating on the barriers to communicating subjective experiences. In particular, he argues that no amount of linguistic description alone would be capable of transporting him into the alien worlds described by Blake as lived realities. He hopes that masculine will help him understand the nature of visionary experiences like these. But rather than being transported into isolated worlds of imaginative fancy like he had expected, Huxley was surprised to discover the degree that masculine altered his perception of the objective world out there, 
His attention, attention becomes captivated by a vase on the table that holds three diverse flowers. Under the gaze of Mescalin, the flowers take on a metaphysical significance, becoming a bundle of minute, unique particulars in which, by some unspeakable yet self-evident paradox, was to be seen the divine source of all existence. In this subtle allusion to William Blake's minute particulars, Huxley depicts his masculine experience as a rebuttal to the dualistic platonic philosophy that seeks to separate being from becoming and ideas from sensations. The connection to Blake's minute particulars is instructive on this point. Resisting enlightenment trends towards generalization, categorization, and abstraction, Blake argued that universality is only ever achieved by attending to the specific details of the material world. This idea has been a recent focus in cognitive literary studies of the embodied mind. Under the influence of Maskelyne, Huxley experienced a divine imminence comparable to Spinoza's concatenation of all things. Fundamentally non-dualist, this experience challenged his allegiance to abstract linguistic categories. Although Huxley read widely in the mystical traditions and even compiled the perennial philosophy, it was an anthology of different mystical texts, he admits that textual descriptions of mystical experiences had failed to adequately communicate their nature to him. It is only with masculine that Huxley is able to fill content into such verbal abstractions. He writes that, quote, the beatific vision, Satchitananda, being awareness bliss, for the first time I understood, not on a verbal level, not by inchoate hints or at a distance, but precisely and completely what those pre uh, prodigious syllables referred to. He recalls having read an essay by Buddhist scholar D.T. Suzuki, who equates universal mind with a mundane hedge at the bottom of the garden. For Huxley, Suzuki's words had only registered as a vaguely pregnant piece of nonsense. Suddenly now, with his recognition of divinity in minute particulars, quote, it was all as clear as day, as evident as Euclid. As a result of this experience, Huxley theorizes that our usual perception of reality is limited by our linguistic categories. The suggestion is that the function, this is quote, uh, the suggestion is that the function of the brain and nervous system and sense organs is in the main eliminative and not productive. Their function is to protect us from being overwhelmed and confused by this mass of largely useless and irrelevant knowledge by shutting out most of what we should otherwise perceive or remember at any moment and leaving only that very small and special selection which is likely to be practically useful. Significantly, a 2012 brain imaging study led by Robin, Robin Carhart Harris has supported Huxley's ideas about the ability of psychedelics to circumvent the mind's reducing valve. These findings and their connection to Huxley were reported in Time Magazine, The New Yorker, and Scientific American, among other news outlets. Time Magazine writes, quote, Huxley and Blake had predicted what turns out to be a key finding of modern neuroscience. Many of the human brain's highest achievements involve preventing actions instead of initiating them and sifting out information rather than collecting and presenting it for conscious consideration. Through his experience with masculine, Huxley arrives at the conviction that normal waking consciousness inhibits the perception of environmental details. In addition to the restrictions imposed by the brain, he emphasizes that analytical thinking and linguistic categories also actively filter out information according to expectations from past experiences. So there's the reducing valve of language and the reducing valve of the central nervous system. In this scenario, conventional uses of language both represent and reinforce the resulting reduced awareness of the surrounding world. For Huxley, the world is hypostatized or petrified by language, which lulls humankind into complacency. Quote, language confirms in him the belief that reduced awareness is the only awareness and bedevils his sense of reality so that he is all too apt to take his concepts for data, his words for actual things. But as Huxley's choice of literary medium suggests, he is not claiming that all language is inherently imprisoning. Instead, he asserts that language has a tendency to exert a kind of perceptual drift towards increasing abstraction, which means that most people, most of the time, know only what comes through the reducing valve and is consecrated as genuinely real by the local language. But other people, at other times, acquire a bypass that manages to partially circumvent the reducing valve. This bypass is either an inborn capacity, as Huxley suggests of William Blake, 
or it is acquired temporarily, either spontaneously or as a result of deliberate spiritual exercises, or through hypnosis, or by means of drugs. Huxley suggests that masculine bypasses the reifying tendencies of language by expanding perception beyond the confines of utilitarian awareness. In presenting the case for masculine as a countermeasure against this reification, he implicitly equates the function of masculine with the function of poetry as described by romantic poets like Percy Shelley and William Blake, although he does not himself make this connection explicitly. In There is No Natural Religion from 1788, for instance, Blake writes that, quote, he who sees the infinite in all things sees God. He who sees the ratio sees himself only. If it were not for the poetic or prophetic character, the philosophic and experimental would soon be at the ratio of all things and stand still, unable to do other than repeat the same dull round over again. Blake's ratio refers to a system of abstraction extrapolated from the limited data provided by past experiences, a system comparable to Huxley's universe of reduced awareness expressed and petrified by language. In other words, he who sees the world through the lens of petrified language sees only what fits within his prevailing paradigm. In expanding perception beyond the prevailing conceptual paradigms, poetry reminds us that there is more to the world than our concepts. We find similar sentiments in A Defense of Poetry from 1821, where Shelley describes of the language of poets, quote, their language is vitally metaphorical. That is, it marks the before unapprehended relations of things and perpetuates their apprehension until the words which represent them become through time signs for portions or classes of thoughts instead of pictures of integral thoughts. And then if no new poet should arise to create afresh the associations which have been thus disorganized, language will be dead to all the nobler purposes of human intercourse. For Shelley, poetic language both induces and perpetuates an expanded awareness. The word marks from this quotation carries multiple meanings. Poetry takes notice of unapprehended relations, identifies them in language, and consequently makes them legible to others. In these capacities, poetry acts beyond and above normal consciousness as it awakens and enlarges the mind itself by rendering it the receptacle of a thousand unapprehended combinations of thought. Rather than generating mere hallucinations, Shelley's choice of the word unapprehended emphasizes a seeing of real relations in the world that earlier escaped the attention of consciousness. This ontological actuality mirrors Huxley's conviction that, quote, the great change induced by mescaline was in the realm of objective fact. Shelley continues in this register, writing that, quote, poetry lifts the veil from the hidden beauty of the world and makes familiar objects be as if they were not familiar. Huxley would similarly describe a dramatic shift in his observation of familiar objects, including his clothing, writing, quote, those folds in the trousers, what a labyrinth of endlessly significant complexity. Without the defamiliarizing and revitalizing forces of poetry or mescaline, language and perception drift towards fixation on abstractions. It is clear from Huxley's life after Doris that he was forever changed by the experience. By his own account, Mesklin became an inflection point in his biography that signaled a fundamental transformation in his thinking. He attests that, quote, until this morning I had known contemplation only in its humbler, its more ordinary forms. Under the influence of Mesklin, Huxley experienced, for the first time, the possibility of experiencing a world without concepts. For a hyper-conceptual intellectual of Huxley's stature, Mescaline was nothing short of revelatory. As Osmond observed later, Mescaline, quote, slowly etched away the patina of his conceptual thinking. The doors of perception was cleansed, and Aldous perceived things with less interference from his enormous rationalizing brain. Huxley's reconceptualization of Romanticism is predicated on changes to his perception of nature under the influence of Mescaline. We recall that in Wordsworth in the Tropics, Huxley characterizes nature as fundamentally alien and bottomlessly strange. Since nature is radically separate from humanity and inhospitable to it, any attempt to merge with nature is illusory and misguided by definition. But Mescaline's dissolution of conceptual boundaries complicates this tidy separation between self and nature. By doors of perception, Huxley embraces the positive potentials of merging individual consciousness with the natural world, writing that, quote, 
when we feel ourselves to be sole heirs of the universe, when the sea flows in our veins and the stars are our jewels, when all things are perceived as infinite and holy, what motive can we have for covetousness or self-assertion, for the pursuit of power or the drearier forms of pleasure? Huxley comes to view um, our sense of separation from nature as the product of the mind's reducing valve and not an actual lasting fact. In a 1959 letter to Thomas Merton, Huxley describes masculine in terms of its ability to reconfigure the outer world, quote, so that it is seen as the young Wordsworth saw it and later described it in the ode on the intimations of immortality and childhood, a universe of inconceivable, inconceivable beauty in which all things are full of life and charged with an obscure but immensely important meaning. Completely absent from this earnest reference to Wordsworth are the accusations of irresponsibility, naivete, and escapism that characterized Huxley's earlier allusions to Wordsworth's poetry. Huxley describes his visionary encounter with his environment as being like Wordsworth's daffodils, a gift beyond price of a new direct insight into the very nature of things. Rather than representing the fetishization of illusory projections, Huxley here cites Wordsworth to illustrate Mescaline's sense of super-reality, offering heightened perceptions of both inner and outer worlds. At the root of Huxley's transformed view of nature, then, is a transformed understanding of the mechanisms involved in perception and cognition. And I should note that I was very surprised that this had not been noticed by scholars before. And I think that part of the reasoning for that is that people have so many associations with what drugs are and what they do that they didn't notice this kind of very, you know, from a distance now, obvious fact of his, you know, past decades of writing. And another thing that I noticed had been overlooked by scholars was I noticed that there was a, a text that he had written almost a decade before uh, there was a perception in 1942 called The Art of Seeing. In The Art of Seeing, he describes using a drug experience to articulate a metaphysical position. So it's significant in Huxley scholarship for that fact that there's a, pre a precursor for his use of masculine in this use of a different drug. In this case, it was uh, a, a dental anesthetic, most likely nitrous oxide. And as he's coming out of the nitrous oxide, he describes, he comes to the, he's, comes to the complete opposite conclusion that he does in Doors of Perception. So in the earlier text, he mentions coming out of the experience, and he doesn't have a sense of self yet. So his first things that he can remember experiencing are just colored blotches in his environment. But he doesn't have a sense of self or outside himself, so it's just color without any kind of fixed form. And then there's an intermediate phase where he has a sense of self, but he doesn't remember Huxley and everything else. It's just a sense of basic subject-object division, and you can kind of see shapes. And it's not until Aldous Huxley, the historical figure, is fully reconstituted with his interests and historical experiences that he's able to see the most details in his environment. Because he says he looks out the window and sees a house, and he knows that style of architecture, so he knows to look for details that he wouldn't otherwise have known to look for or see, much as a, as, as a trapper or hunter might notice uh, animal markings in the forest that someone who's unfamiliar with that might not see. But what's so fascinating about that is that it's a complete inversion, because by the time you get to Doors of Perception, he comes to the opposite conclusion, where it's actually the cognitive mind and historical associations that gets in the way of experiencing reality on its own terms. And, and just in terms of the larger significance of this, I just wanted to end with a final quotation from his, um, his Santa Barbara lecture series. And I've only, the only place I have found this quotation listed anywhere is in a Santa Barbara newspaper talking about the anniversary of the essay. I haven't found it cited by anybody um, ahead of time. No, no scholars have I I've seen this. So it's, it's kind of surprising because I think it's a really significant quotation. If we all had the doors of our perceptions cleansed and we all saw the world as infinite and holy, we should all find it a great deal less necessary to go in for bullfighting, attacking minorities, or working up frenzies against foreign people. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much. <laughs>